Ready to see some amazing experiments? Yes! A triumph! We're going to show you how your incredible body works. <laughs> Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, we're looking at a pair of organs that really clean up. Chris, what are you doing? I'm cleaning and tidying the labs, aunt. I thought we had one of those self-cleaning laboratories. Would you like some orange juice? Oh, I'd love some. Yeah, it's thirsty work, this. Here you go. Thanks, Sand. Mm. <laughs> ah! It's got juicy bits in it! Ah! Now, Chris doesn't like bits in his orange juice any more than your body doesn't like bits or waste products in your bloodstream. And what your kidneys do is help to get rid of them. Now, I can remove the bits from the orange juice using this filter. Hey, that's my tea strainer. Whatever. It gets rid of all the little bits in the orange juice, just like your kidneys get rid of all the little bits from your blood that your body doesn't want. In 24 hours, your kidneys filter and clean 200 litres of blood. And it's even more amazing when you see what a real kidney looks like. Now, this pair is from a pig, but they're very similar to yours. It might look a bit gross, but your kidneys are amazing. This tube here is the main blood vessel carrying blood into the kidneys, full of waste, waiting to be removed. The blood gets filtered and another tube carries the waste, we, down to this sack here, which is your bladder. And your bladder empties when you go to the loo. And that's the pipe that takes away the cleaned up blood and sends it back around your body. Right, let's have a closer look. Scalpel, please, Dr. Chris. Now, inside the kidney is where all this filtering takes place. There we go. This is done by a special thing called a nephron. There's about a million in each kidney, and they're so small you can't see them. So we've had to pay good money for this photo of one under a microscope. Chris, don't you just hate it when a bit of the body is so small that you can only see it with a microscope. I do, I do, I hate it. But, luckily, I've got just this eventuality covered. Ooh. Come with me, Zand. Your kidneys are an amazing filtration system, and we're going to show you. To do it, I've made these. Two super-sized kidney models. One for me, and one for you, Zand. These are great! Finally, a kidney model looks big enough to actually see what's going on. I love it! Yeah, I thought you'd like it. So, we're going to use our giant-sized models to show you just how your real-life kidneys clean your blood. Now, this jar represents a single nephron inside your kidneys. And just like in the real kidney, Chris has put a tube bringing blood into the nephron here, another tube bringing cleaned up blood out of the kidney, and then a third tube taking the waste away. It's amazing! OK, well, uh, thanks, Son. Now, the liquid that represents your blood is here. It's got water and red glitter in it for a bit of colour. Now, we're going to pump our very attractive glittery blood through our nephrons to give us an idea of how your kidney works in real life. Are you ready, Zahn? I'm ready, Chris. Let's go. And pump. So what you can see here is the glittery blood flowing into the nephron. And it gets filtered through the nephron and then the nice clean blood travels back along the renal vein, back to the body full of all the nice stuff your body wanted to keep. Uh, Chris! And everything else, the waste, comes out here. Chris! Out of the ureter and into the bladder. Chris! My urine's darker than yours. Oh, so it is. I must have given you the dehydrated kidney. I wanted to show everyone what happens if you don't drink enough water. Oh, I see. Clever. If your wee is dark in colour, like this, it's a pretty reliable sign that your body isn't getting enough water. Being dehydrated is not good for you. Your body works best when it has enough water. Light-coloured wee, like on my nicely working kidney, is a sign that you're well hydrated. So we've seen how your kidneys are an amazing filter, cleaning up your blood and getting rid of things your body doesn't need. And the wee they produce is a pretty good sign of whether you should be drinking more water. Light yellow wee is good. Speaking of drinking more, I'd like a glass of orange juice. Now, I have some oranges here for you to squeeze for me. OK, Zand. Wait a minute, he's forgotten the oranges. Chris, you've forgotten the oranges! <laughs> It's Chris. Can I have a biscuit? Hmm. I don't want one of your disgusting pocket digestives. Okay, fair enough. 
described like a custard cream. Well, I don't know where he keeps his custard creams. He hides them from me. They're on the desk in front of you. Oh, yeah, here they are. I've counted them. Can you write them down in the custard cream logbook so I can keep track? Chris, why are you sending me all these ridiculous text messages? I'm trying to work. Well, I'm glad you asked me that, Zant. It's not just because I want those custard creams, although I do want them. You've written them in the logbook now. It's because today's lab is all about hormones. And like text, hormones are messages, but they're chemical ones sent around your body. You can't control them any more than Zant could control the number of texts I was sending him. You have hormones from the moment you're born, telling the different cells in your body what to do. Your pancreas makes the hormone insulin to control sugar levels in your blood. And your adrenal glands produce the hormone adrenaline when you're excited or scared, preparing your body for immediate action. And then there's your pituitary gland in your brain. And to show you what that looks like, I've actually got a real sheep's brain in my hand. Now, the first thing you'll notice is it's much smaller than a human brain. And that's probably why sheep are less intelligent than human beings. Chris, there might be sheep watching. It doesn't matter, they're sheep. They won't understand what I just said. All right, well, I've cut it in half so you can see right here at the base of the brain is the pituitary gland. Now, take a look at this MRI scan of my actual brain. And there's my pituitary gland right there. Now, it may be small, but it has a big job to do because it's the pituitary gland that controls most of the hormones in your body. But when you reach puberty, your hormones go into supercharge mode. They spring into action like never before, and they're responsible for all the changes that take place during puberty. And one of these changes occurs in the voice box, the organ which allows you to speak. And we're going to show you what it looks like. Now, with this is the larynx or the voice box of a young pig. Your voice box is in your throat. It's the tough, rubbery bit here on your neck. Now, I also have a pig's larynx, except that mine is bigger than Chris's, and that's because it's from an adult pig. Now, one of these two larynxes will have a deeper sound than the other, but which one do you think it's going to be? The bellows are acting like your lungs, sending air past the vocal cords, which you can see here and they make a sound when they vibrate. Compare the sound of this smaller larynx to the sound of the larger one. Can you hear the sound of the larger one is deeper than the smaller one? This change in sound is known as your voice breaking, and it happens to both boys and girls. Now, when you go through puberty, those hormones controlled by your pituitary gland tell your larynx to grow bigger, and that makes your voice get deeper. So, we've shown you that hormones are messages telling your body what to do. When you start puberty, your hormones become more active, telling you to grow into an adult. And remember, hormones are what make your voice break, only nothing's breaking at all. Your larynx actually gets bigger, and that makes your voice deeper. But whether you're a boy or a girl, don't panic, because it doesn't hurt at all. It's all completely normal. It's definitely more obvious for us boys, because our larynxes grow more than girls, and so it pushes this bit out. It's called your Adam's apple. Ow, why don't you poke your own Adam's apple? It's more fun poking yours. Stop it, it's really annoying. Really annoying, like sending somebody loads of text messages. Stop poking my Adam's apple. How do you do that? Ready to see some amazing experiments? Yes! A triumph! We're going to show you how your incredible body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, we're looking at how we power our bodies. Now, this experiment is to show you what happens inside your body every time you eat. Right, now, son, what I needed you to do is take that tube, and when I give you the instruction, blow, I want you to blow into it. On blow, I go. That's right, you go on blow. <laughs> Son, why did you do that? You said blow. But now we have to set it all up again. For this experiment, we're using lycopodium powder to represent food. OK, Zond, blow torch on. Are you ready, Zond? Ready! Blow! Wow! Whoa! So what's going on? 
the lycopodium powder, has mixed with the air breathed out by Zond, been ignited by the flame, causing a chemical reaction which releases lots of energy. Now, although there's no fire inside you, chemically this is what happens in your body when you eat. Your food is fuel, just like the lycopodium powder. It mixes with the oxygen and releases energy, which is what allows you to do all sorts of things, whether it's just breathing or running around. But how much energy do you need? And is there such a thing as too much? Well, we're going to find out. Your body is a bit like an engine, so it needs fuel for all the things it has to do. To show you what I mean, I've rigged up a simple engine system, and I'm going to need Zahn's body. Oh, well, no problem at all, Chris. My body is ready at the service of science. For many years, I... Actually, Zahn, I don't need that body. What? But you just said... I've got Mini Zond to help me. What? I've clamped his legs. Is that a wire in the back of his head? What is going on? Mini Zond is hooked up to an engine system which represents what your body does with the food and drink that you consume. I can do what he's doing. Stop it. When you eat and drink, your body uses it to create energy. So, with this engine, this hose, full of water, represents your food and drink. And when I squirt it onto the wheel, the wheel will turn, creating energy which is sent to the light bulb on Mini Zahn's head, which represents his energy levels. OK, so what now? Well, we're going to see what happens when different amounts of the fuel are pumped through to Mini Zahn. First, this is what happens to Mini Zand when he eats just the right amount of energy. It's a bit like if you eat a decent breakfast, lunch and dinner. So you can see we have a nice balance here. Mini Zand's light is on and everything is working perfectly. Your body takes the fuel and turns it into the right amount of energy you need for an average day. But what about if Mini Zand has had a really busy day and he forgot to eat lunch? That does happen. Good question, Zand. Well, let's find out. Now, I'm putting less water on the wheel, and it's not spinning, so the light bulb isn't coming on. This is not good. Exactly. That's what happens if you don't eat enough. Your poor body has no energy to do what it needs to, and as a result, you feel tired, and it can mean your body won't be able to perform all its functions properly. Well, that could make him ill. I think you need to give him some more fuel right now, Chris. Yes, but I think we also need to see what happens if you eat or drink too much, like that extra chocolate biscuit I saw you eating earlier, Zant. Let's have a look. So now there's plenty of energy to power Mini Zant and his light bulb. But we're putting so much fuel in, it's getting fuller than it should be. Exactly. And that's what happens when you eat more than you need to. Your body has to find something to do with all that excess fuel. Something tells me Mini Zahn is about to change. Well, the excess fuel creates unused energy, which gets turned into fat cells. Mini Zahn is becoming overweight. Oh, no! Poor Mini Zahn! So we've seen how when you drink and eat food, your body combines it with oxygen to create energy. And that energy fuels the things you do every day. But it's important to get the balance right between what goes in and what you use. Too little and you can become underweight. Too much and you can become overweight. But unlike Mini Zand, no one becomes too thin or too fat overnight. It takes a long time to happen, so as long as you keep things balanced most of the time, your body will be happy. And of course, if you hadn't clamped Mini Zand's legs, he'd have been able to do some exercise and he'd have been fine. Uh, what are you doing? I'm taking Mini Zand for a run. But first, I'm going to buy him some decent gym gear, a chassis sports top, some good shorts, some sweatbands, a pair of decent trainers. Zand, I thought you were kidding. Ouch! And now to our lab. Ouch! For some amazing body experiments. Ugh! Just don't try anything you see here at home. Take a look at this. This is an MRI scan of my tongue as I'm speaking, and you can see it's pretty huge. But speaking isn't the only thing you need your tongue for. One of the best things it does is to help you taste. Your tongue is covered in small hair-like projections, as I'm going to show you. Right, Zand, open your mouth nice and wide. <coughs> oh, not hair like that. I said hair-like projections. Can't see them with your naked eye, so take a look at this. This is a super close-up of your tongue. This red blob is called a papilla, 
Your taste buds sit on the side of it and they contain tiny hair-like projections called microvilli to help you taste. And if you look at your tongue, the bumps you can see are the papillae. And the more papillae you have on your tongue, the more taste buds you have and the more sensitive to taste you are. And you have more of them than we do. Because we're doctors. No, on because we're adults. We have around 5,000 covering our tongues, but you have 10,000. That's twice as many. And to prove it, Chris, I've brought in a sample. This sample is nine years old. This isn't a sample, it's a child. Anyway, the point is, we're going to compare Chris's papillae with the samples. But first, I need to cover your tongues in blue food dye. The blue dye will show up all the papillae. And now, the sample. I have a name, you know, and it's Hermione. Very noisy sample. Give me your tongue. Nice blue tongue, Hermione. Zand is putting a glass slide on both our tongues to make it easier to count the papillae. Chris's papillae are those little pale dots right there. And these are Hermione's. You can see that there's way more on her tongue, and that means more taste buds. Good job, Hermione. As we get older, your taste buds deteriorate and they aren't replaced, which is why you will be much more sensitive to strong flavours like garlic than your mum or dad. There are certain things, though, like a cold, <laughs> that can play havoc with everybody's sense of taste. But why would having a bunged-up nose affect your taste? Well, we're going to show you. Zand, meet Mr Big Mouth. Hello. Ah, you've cut him in half. Why don't you call him Mr Cut in Half? Zand, now, when you eat food, odour molecules are released and swirl around your mouth, but also right up into this. This is the passage that connects your mouth to your nose. And right up here, at the back of your nose, are lots of sensors called olfactory receptors, which sense and identify different odour or smell molecules and tell your brain what it is you're tasting. So, to show you this, we're going to use an equally oversized bit of kit. The smell molecule blower thingy. Also, we'll need our safety equipment and these polystyrene balls to represent those smell or odour molecules. Three, two, one, blow! We're cheating a bit because our smell molecules are being blown in, but inside your body, the smell molecules in food are released naturally as you chew. Wow, that worked really well. You can see how the smell molecules race through the back of the mouth and up the tube connecting it to the nose and right onto the olfactory receptors, which instantly recognise the smell and tell your brain what you're tasting. And your olfactory receptors can also protect you because they can tell if something is bad before you eat it. As soon as they whiff something like off milk, they alert your brain so you know not to eat it. But Zant, what would happen if Mr Big Mouth got a cold? That would be disgusting. We're going to need a lot of snot. We're smearing our snot inside the passages of our giant mouth and nose, just like when you have a cold. Let's see what happens now that Mr Big Mouth has got a big cold. Ready? Go. Look. This time, the odour molecules are getting stuck in the snot. They aren't getting anywhere near the olfactory receptors. And that means no taste. Yeah, Mr Big Nose wouldn't be able to taste anything at all. Except for that one tiny polystyrene ball. So we've shown you that, like Hermione's tongue, you've got twice the number of taste buds as us, or your mum and dad, or any adult. But as good as your tongue is, you also need your nose if you really want to savour a flavour. <laughs> and now to our lab... Ouch! ..for some amazing body experiments. Oh. Just don't try anything you see here at home. Ooh, spaghetti bolognese, my absolute favourite. It's on. Yes, sir. This is delicious, by the way. It's not for you, it's for our experiment. But it's tasty, and I'm hungry. Look, you can have some later, perhaps, but I want to talk about food now, because every year you eat about 500 kilograms of food, and that's enough to fill two bathtubs to the brim. Why are you keeping food in the bath? Food goes in the fridge. 
If you keep the food in the bathtub, where do I have a bath? In the fridge? Look, Zond, no one's interested in your kitchen bathroom confusions. Now, you don't just eat food because it tastes good. Your body is actually an amazing energy conversion machine. So it's constantly turning what you eat into energy, even when you're asleep. And you use the energy from this food for all sorts of things, which is why I need this spag bowl, Zond. Now, watch. You use up to 75% of every meal for things like breathing, circulating blood and growing. Are you trying to make a pie chart out of spaghetti bolognese? Why don't you use a pie? Well, I, I had a pie for this very job, but it just vanished from the fridge. I hate it when that happens. Then 10% of what you eat is used up simply to digest what you've just eaten. I think that's a little bit more than 10%, Chris. I'll just adjust it for you. The remaining 15% is used up doing things you choose to do. Whether it's watching Operation Out, walking your dog or playing with your mates. But how does your body turn your food into energy? Well, we're going to show you. In order to release chemical energy from food, your body has to combine it with oxygen from the air. That's why you breathe. Now, we've got pure oxygen here. Now, we also have one digestive biscuit here, and then the same weight of pasta. Now, they might be the same weight, but they give your body different types of energy. We're going to release the energy from both the pasta and the biscuit so you can see the different levels of energy you get from each. First up, pasta. And I'm going to soak it in this liquid oxygen. Inside your body, when oxygen and food are combined, a chemical reaction happens naturally. But outside the body, we need to ignite the chemical reaction using fire. Now, we're using special equipment to do this experiment in our lab, so don't even think about trying this at home. It's a terrible way of cooking pasta, especially after you did such a nice job with that spaghetti. Son, it's not a cookery show. This is about energy. Pasta releases energy in your body slowly and steadily, just like the small, steady flame burning here. But how will the digestive biscuit compare to the pasta? Will it, A, release more energy, or B, less energy. Let's find out. Ready? Whoa! <laughs> now that burns in quite a different way to the pasta. So yes, the massive flame shows that our biscuit does immediately release more energy, but don't be fooled by our action replay. It's for a shorter amount of time. It's why you might immediately perk up after eating something sweet, but then have a slump soon after. 